The next panel is Robert Graybell, Graybell, Mary Lewis, Sarah Watkins, Amanda Lodoza, <coughs> Brett Murfish, Linda Burgess. No? Any of those individuals here, I'm going to change all those to show that they are registering a physician. All of them are in opposition, but they are not here to provide oral testimony. Next group, well, hang on, let me. Next group, Patricia Perkinson, Mary Black, Kathleen Keller, Roseanne Scott, while she's coming up, Fran Frank Carlson, Stacy Sigmund, for those who were not here, I'm going to show them not being here to provide oral Early testimony, but registering the physician. Roseanne Scott. Hi, everyone. My name is Roseanne Scott. The Honorable Kirk Watson represents me. I am here to testify against SB1. I testify on behalf of myself, my husband, our four children, our eight grandchildren, and our five great-grandchildren. First of all, I'd like to thank this committee for the manner in which these proceedings have been conducted. It has been a much more civil and respectful procedure than my experience with testimony before the House Committee two weeks ago. I shared during that testimony that my 19-year-old granddaughter is seven weeks pregnant. She just completed her first year of college where she is on full scholarship. Since that testimony, she has chosen to carry this pregnancy to term. I fully respect and support her in this choice, just as I would fully support and respect another choice that she would make. I realize I am not going to change any minds tonight, but it is my moral obligation to all of my family to have my voice heard in an attempt to safeguard their rights. Until they are of an age where they can make decisions for themselves, I am honored to be here on their behalf. Who knows? Fifteen years from now, my great-granddaughter may condemn me as a godless heathen and damn to spend eternity in hell. That is her right. My job is to love, respect, guide, and support them in all things, not only those that fall in line with my beliefs. That the, yeah, the state of Texas is not my nor my family's parent, God, doctor, or life partner. Thank you. I let you conclude. That. Thank you. Frank Carlson. Go ahead. Honorable committee members, this is my name is Frank Carlson. This is my first time ever testifying, and I honestly, I, I honestly doubt it will be my last. Um, I am a member of. Troy Frazier's Senate District, although for eight years I did live in Senator Duell's district. And um, I oppose Senate Bill 1 on several grounds. One, while this hearing has been going on today, a federal court has already ruled that the 30-mile um, admittance requirement, which was put forth in the Wisconsin Senate and passed, was ruled unconstitutional and is, cannot be applied as is. And since that is included in Senate Bill 1, we need to strike that down before we have the same issue here and have to deal with the lawsuits and everything that goes with it. 
Also, in doing some research, the University of California in San Francisco did a study of the long-term effects of women who were had performed late-term abortions versus those who just missed the deadline and had to continue with their unwanted pregnancies. <laughs> and it was a long-term study looking at the effect, how the women fared 10 to 20 years after their pre after the abortion or pregnancy happened. And those who were forced to carry through the pregnancy had higher rates of suicide, lower wages, um, lower self-esteem, and higher rates of other mental health issues. And I conclude my testimony. Thank you. Both of you. Rosemary Kurtz. Is Rosemary Kurtz here? Lori Brown Totole. And these individuals that I'm calling out have all registered their opposition to the bill. If they do not tell me they're here, I'm going to change their request to provide oral testimony to registering a position in opposition to the bill. Macy McDonald. <coughs> Kelly McDonald. Piper McDonald. Stephen Wexler. Ginger Miles. Re Rebecca Gonzalez. While she's coming up, Carmen Zaya. Tammy Herman. Olga Haley or Daly? Haley? Daly? Come on. Carmen Zaya? That's you. Okay, go first. Thank you very much. My name is Carmen Zayas. I'm a mother of two grown children. I live in Williamson County, Cedar Park, and I'm here in opposition to Senate Bill 1. My husband asked me recently, he said, why are you staying up so late when you have a 9 o'clock meeting? You've been here for three weeks. He's come. My kids have come. I'm very proud of that. My parents couldn't come. And he said, they're not going to listen to a word you say. They're not going to listen to thousands of women who have taken off from work, who have driven or, or flown to be here. He goes, why do you feel the need to have to say something? And I said, because 45 years ago, my parents left Cuba, and they, brought, they left the country they loved and their family, and they brought us here because of the democratic process. And I'll be darned if I'm going to go home tonight and look at my 76-year-old mom and dad and not say that I didn't speak out. I'm speaking out. You guys know this is illegal. You know it's unconstitutional. You know it is a woman's right. There are people in this hearing that speak about smaller government and individual rights, except, of course, when it comes to women. I'm here speaking for the democratic process. We are telling you, we do not believe in this. You are not representing us. You really need to stop. And I would love to see some courage to stand up to whatever politics are behind this and instead really take care of the people that vote and the people that you're supposed to be representing. I really appreciate that you've allowed people to speak tonight and that you stayed here. That speaks highly to, to you and the people in this room. However, I've got to tell you, for the last three weeks, it's been a mockery of our democratic system, and it's made me embarrassed to be a part of it. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Gonzalez? That's me. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman and the rest of the Senate panel. I appreciate this opportunity to be one of the last voices that you hear today. Um, I really would like to let you know how much this is costing me to be here. Uh, a few years ago, I made the decision to be an entrepreneur and to start my own business and support myself and my family. And the time I've spent here with you over the past week, I have not gotten paid every time I'm here. But it meant so much for me to be here, to speak out for my rights and for the rights of all the women of Texas. I think there's these testimonies are steeped in such irony for me because all these women who have gotten up and said that they regret their abortions, they regret the things they've done, my heart truly goes out to them. 
And I feel terrible for them that they had to experience something so terrible and to regret it so at this point in their lives. But the irony for me is all of these women had the choice. And they choose to deny other women that very choice. I also would like to compel you to think about more domestic violence um, measures in front of your Senate. Because all of these women who stood up here and testified, they were forced against their will by husbands, by fathers, by mothers, by anyone to have an abortion. That's a crime. No one should be forced to have something that they don't want happen to their own body. Make no mistake, no one wants an abortion. And if anyone stands up here and tells you that they do want an abortion and that's their only method of birth control, I find that very, very difficult to believe. I don't feel I'm pro-abortion, but I am pro-choice. And I really feel that this is something that really needs to be opened up to the citizens of Texas to let their um, true opinions know. Thank you so much for allowing me to be one of the last voices you hear, and I'm represented by Senator Kirk Watson here in Austin, Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Olga Paley? Yes. Um, hello. My name is Olga Paley, and I'm speaking against SB1 today and representing myself. As an engineer and a scientist, I will leave the personal and emotional anecdotes to those who feel moved to share them. I feel compelled to contribute some specifics and data. The references are included in the papers I handed you. In 2008, Texas had 67 abortion clinics, but 92% of Texas counties had no abortion provider, and 33% of Texas women lived in these counties. If this bill were implemented today, any of the five clinics left open would be as far as a 550-mile or eight-hour drive for some Texas women. So if the state seeks to so dramatically limit access, and the question is, what do we gain in return with regards to women's safety, as so many quote-unquote experts have testified up here today? Let me quote some experts myself. The American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has concluded that hospital admitting privileges are unnecessary requirements without a basis in public health or safety. To quote their statement, this bill requires hospital admitting privileges for physicians performing an outpatient procedure that bears low risk. No other outpatient procedure requires a physician to have active admitting privileges in the hospital within a specific distance. This means that if we truly care about patient safety, perhaps we ought to extend these requirements to procedures like wisdom teeth removal and laser eye and bunion surgery. Additionally, the Texas Hospital Association has stated that hospital admitting privileges are not appropriate and are unnecessary in emergency situations, since any woman in such a situation will present in the emergency room, privileges or not. Uh, the American Journal of Public Health in April 2009 wrote that ambulatory surgical center requirements significantly increase abortion costs and reduce the availability of abortion services despite the lack of any evidence that using those facilities positively affects health outcomes. Pro Roe v. Wade, as many as 5,000 American women died annually as a direct result of unsafe abortions. Today, abortion is one of the most commonly performed clinical procedures in the United States, and the current death rate from abortion at all stages of gestation is 0.6 per 100,000 procedures. This is 11 times safer than carrying a pregnancy to term and nearly twice as safe as a penicillin injection, and yet this bill would require every abortion to be treated like brain surgery. Let us not pretend that the lack of access we will see if this bill is implemented is unintentional. The loss of access is not a bug of this bill, it is a feature. Thank and you. Texas women deserve better. Thank you. Tammy Herman? Tammy Herman. Go ahead. Um, I'm against the, the bill. I represent myself. And uh, pretty much everything I'm going to say I've heard over and over and over today. I know you've heard it over and over, and I've heard it over and over the past three weeks. But I didn't want to miss this opportunity, even though it's redundant. I wanted to uh, at least hear my own voice tell all of you the same thing you've already heard, probably. Anyway, we elect and we pay you to put together comprehensive bills that have been carefully researched, bills and laws that are substantiated by facts, statistics, and needs. I can't see how this bill meets any of these standards. You assert in this bill that ASCs are better equipped and better regulated than our existing abortion clinics. Existing regulations on state-regulated abortion clinics are actually more effective than the ASC requirements in SB1, as they require more frequent state inspections and have very specific quality assurance requirements for abortion procedures. Ellen Cooper, expert witness, uh, testified that ASCs are only expected once every three to six years, where Texas uh, abortion clinics are inspected once a year. Um, so I, I'm not feeling this is really about women's health. 
I, I am feeling this is a bit fraudulent and more 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 leaning towards um, doing away with abortion and, and a right for women to choose. Uh, especially uh, after I read the article uh, that Senator uh, where Senator Hagar uh, rejected uh, exemption for rape, incest, or women with pre-existing psychological conditions when asked what he planned to do to lower the risk of unwanted pregnancy, he said, the bill is not a funding mechanism for women's health. Exactly. It's not. I don't see how it is. So I'm done. Thank you for listening. Thank you.